What is consciousness, Carl? <laughs> so you're actually using techniques. I mean, even putting psychiatry aside, just looking at optogenetics, you're trying to understand some of these deep aspects of the human mind. And maybe this is a good time to return to a question you mentioned you might have an opinion on if there's such a thing as a theory of everything for the human mind. Yeah. Because surely answering of what is consciousness is as, well, that's not sure, but it seems like it's a fundamental part of the human experience in the human mind and solving that question will result in solving the bigger thing about the human mind. The flip side could be consciousness is just the few neurons that are generating some useful thing that make us, it's like uh, the the sense of self that you talked about in the, uh, in the mice. Maybe it's a subset of those cells that are just creating a richer sense of self and that's it. Yeah. So th this is a great question. All, all neuroscientists think about this and a lot of non-neuroscientists too. It's, it's such a, it's the reason a lot of people came to the study of the brain is to think about consciousness and not just being awake or alert, but really what's sometimes called the hard problem of consciousness, which is what is that nature of that inner subjective sense we have, not just information processing, but feeling something about the information. That What is that inner state of subjectivity physically? What is it? And that's called the hard problem of consciousness. And it's not a extremely well-defined question. Everybody has sort of a sense of what it means, uh, but it's such a hard problem because you run into paradoxes quite quickly the more you think about it. And that is exciting also because it makes us think, actually there's some fundamental, there's a big thing that we're missing. It, the brain is not just a collection of little tricks. There is a big, big concept. So that's your sense of the big, because like a flip side could be with optogenetics, you can, there's an engineering question. Can you turn consciousness on and off like a light switch? Okay, so here, here's where exactly consciousness frames the problem extremely well. And it, it frames it the following way. So I, I told you earlier that we can stimulate 20 or 25 cells in the visual cortex of a mouse, and we can make it behave, and we can make its brain act as if it's seeing something that isn't there. We have that level of control now. We can pick out 25 neurons, play in activity, in both behavior and in the brain, it's as if it's seeing something specific. Okay, now let's do a thought experiment, you know, a Gedanken experiment, uh, and let's play this out Let's say we could do the same thing for every single neuron in the brain of a human being. Let's say we had total control and I could do something like, I could show you a rich, deep color red and you could look at it and you would be aware that it's red, but also you might have some feelings about it. You, some, something would be stirred in you, some subjective sense as you looked at that rich color red. And then I would take away the visual stimulus and I would, in this thought experiment, I would using some hyperoptogenetics, I would play in exactly the same pattern of activity in every cell in your brain for as long as was needed, whatever, 15 seconds, something like that, that exactly matched what was going on when you were feeling that inner subjective sense. Okay, so in that thought experiment, a question for you is, would you be feeling that same inner subjective sense? Stimulus is gone, Every neuron's doing the same thing because I'm controlling it. There's a philosophical question there. I'm, if, if you ask me specifically, I would say yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Most people would say that because it's hard to say no, right? It's very hard to say if no. If every cell in your brain is doing what it was doing, what, what else could be different? How could- Well, most normal people would say yes. Of course, philosophers would then start saying no. They're, they're, they're the ones that say, um, I'm I'm in sort of to parallel, and, and sorry if it's a bit of an interruption. But if there's you know if there's a robot that's conscious in front of you, if it appears conscious, then it's conscious. Like to me, uh, of course, philosophers again speak up and say, "Well, no, how do you know it's conscious? Well, how do you know anything is conscious?" And sort of as normal humans, we tend to. Um, lean on the experience versus some kind of 
philosophical concept. Yeah. So the great thing about the the what you just said, the the Turing test is it's very practical. If it acts conscious, it is conscious. But I think that's limiting. I like the the thought experiment. I think it's actually more informative. And so I'm I'm halfway halfway to the <laughs> to the conclusion there. But let's 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 take it as your your answer was yes that yes. that you would be feeling the same thing. Okay. Now here's where it gets fun. Now that every cell in your brain is knows what it has to do in the sense that we know it and we're providing it, your brain cells don't need to be in your head anymore at all, right? The only reason they're next to each other, the only reason they're wired together is to affect each other, to stimulate or inhibit each other. But we don't need that anymore because optogenetically, we're providing that activity pattern for as long as needed. We're providing the effect of the communication. They don't need to be connected anymore. They don't even need to be in your head. I could spread your neurons all over the continent, all over the galaxy, and I could still provide the same stimulus pattern over 10 or 15 seconds to all those neurons, and somewhere Lex Friedman would be, would have to be, even though no longer existing as a physical object anymore, would be feeling that subjective feeling. And it's inescapable because it's exactly the same as the previous situation. All the neurons have to be uh, spatially, uh, like the locality constraint, they have to be spatially close to each other. Yeah. Uh, and you talk about light, opto, which is funny because, you know, light is the fastest traveling thing that we know of. Maybe let's not put them all over the universe because we might get relativistic problems then. Let's let's just keep them on. Let's keep all your neurons. Let's spread them over North America, okay? And yeah. and let's let's play them out. Same pattern of activity. And right, it, it seems absurd, right? There's no way that could be true. There's no way that 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 Lex would be feeling that internal sense if his neurons were spread all over North America. And yet, it's exactly the same as the previous situation where you said, sure. Well, so we've got a paradox, and it, and this is what makes people is this think a paradox. Though, sorry, you, you well, make, yeah, yeah, maybe paradox I, is the wrong word. We got a problem. <laughs> we got a problem yeah. because it reveals that there's something big about those that internal subjective state that we, we're not explaining, and we don't really have a hope of explaining in the near future. But don't you think we would still have that? It's just the word "internal" loses meaning. But don't you think we would still have that internal subjective state? Where's the uh, if not, then where the heck is the magic coming from? Okay, well, I just think, yeah. I think there, one, of, one of the problems that I think we need to let go of is we tend to, outside of the experience of consciousness, the hard problem of consciousness, we tend to think that we individual humans are really special. Not the subjective experience, but the entirety of it, like the body, that contains the thing. So the lo local, the 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 constraint of all the stuff has to be together, and it's all mine. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> no, yeah. That that's yeah, a yeah. very. I don't know if that has anything to do with the mechanisms that are creating this. So, I, and in fact, one really nice way to break through that is to either achieve, either observe, or create consciousness that spans multiple organisms sort of so like that say it's not it's not an organism dependent uh phenomena that the phenomena can that's just a peculiar way it has evolved on earth but it it's it's a, it's a phenomena that doesn't have anything to do with a specific um biological system right so and we have different parts of our brain exists and sometimes create complex awarenesses of things that involve different neurons that are distributed widely and that need to communicate with each other to form this joint representation, this state of consciousness. But indeed, why do they have to be in the same head? We don't know why that would be the case that they do. And so that's a, a huge unanswered question in the field is, is what is it that binds the activity of neurons together so they can form a joint representation? 
And actually, this comes back to the dissociation experiment we talked about before, where you can your sense of self becomes separated from your 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 body. Those things that were fused in a joint representation, the same concept, unitary, are now separate. And in late 2020, we published a paper in Nature showing how this could be. We used optogenetics to drive this rhythm that ketamine and PCP cause in retrosplenial cortex, and we got different parts of the brain to be out of sync and when they were active, never able to be active at the same time, never able to form a joint representation at the same time. And so we've got a toehold into these questions. We don't have the answers, but... And that mimics the dynamics of uh, ketamine effects. Exactly, exactly. And you're able to find that kind of oscillation to... Oh, wow, wow, wow. And so if you get even greater and greater control with more control over individual neurons and understanding, like if you think of certain neurons that having some role to play in, in the sense of self, you can play like an orchestra um, that to create the certain degrees of consciousness, degrees of subjectivity, and thereby understand what is consciousness. But uh, of, by having a very complicated light switch, essentially. That and here's the here's the challenge is is the nice thing about the the thought experiment is it it kind of highlights that we're going to hit a point where we're addressing some very very fundamental questions. What 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 allows the activity of two sets of neurons to become mutually relevant to each other? This is this is in some ways maybe the one of the deepest remaining questions in neuroscience is is what allows activity patterns to become relevant to each other? Do they have to be in sync temporally? Do they need to be? Uh, is there some other quality that we don't know about that also needs to be present to allow cells to to fuse together into a joint representation? Just just so I understand, because it uh, it feels close to some very, very deep idea. Um, so there's a bunch of semi-distributed signals going on in the brain. And you're saying there could be something like a theory of everything, if, if one to exist, is to understand why, how and why signals close to each other start becoming relevant to each other. That's right, that's right as part of some very much bigger uh, signal that they're producing. That's right. How they coordinate, essentially, um, because it's very distributed. I mean, that's a kind of, within a distributed system, how is order achieved? Right. Uh, and this is a very specific kind of distributed system that is yes. one of the most intelligent that we're aware of in the known universe. In that will maybe be something also an understanding of the the full conscious experience too. That this kind of coordination, how does the coordination between different neurons that are responsible for sense of self, how do they begin to form a big picture that we see as a human experience? That's really really interesting. So uniting the small and the, I mean <laughs> that's actually literally theory of everything. Uniting the small, the sort of the theory of the neuron. Um, the functioning of the neuron with the big, just the, um, the the functioning of the entire mind. That's right. And I think keeping a toehold in both at the cellular level of resolution and the brain-wide resolution will be critical. If you lose touch with either, I think you'll miss the big insight. So that's what we're trying to do, keeping our keeping grounded in the cellular resolution, trying to keep the, the broadest brain-wide perspective and meet in the middle. Do you think you'll see it in your lifetime? A major breakthrough in that dimension. I have hope. I have hope. I'm. I'm. Uh, it's very hard to predict what will happen with with big things like this. If we don't get there, there'll be plenty of other exciting stuff. So it's okay. 